this evening. It is a privilege to be here with you guys, and I am grateful for this opportunity. Ah, I feel the feel the feel the wind there. I feel the wind. Hallelujah! I feel the wind. Uh, but it is a pleasure to be with you guys here tonight, and uh, to just share in the word of the Lord with you, and also uh, be a laborer in this uh, metropolitan area together. Amen. And so my family and I are laboring in uh, Portland and in the northwest Portland area. And so it's a pleasure to be laboring with you, our brothers and sisters. And it's an honor to preach God's word to you tonight. I'm grateful for your pastor. I celebrate this beautiful property that God has provided. We get to get a tour earlier and just see what the Lord's doing around here. And so it's absolutely amazing to see tonight and today together with you guys. Well, I'm just going to be really, uh, I tend to be this way, but I, I'm just pretty simple guy and pretty straightforward. And so um, tonight when I got to church, I thought I had some direction. And then we had started having church, and it just seemed like God put something totally different on my heart. So I'm messing with the sound people and the media people tonight, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to go. I know this is, you're going to guys be like, I don't know who this guy is. But I'm going to go with the unexpected that God started putting on my heart. Because my flesh would like to stick with what I was starting with. So I'm going to accept that the Lord said change, change your direction. Is that all right? And, uh, and we all need an act of God. Because what I feel like he wants me to share, I need to preach to you like a car salesman. I mean, it, there is... A lot of information here, um, but I hope you'll receive it. And here's what I believe, of course, and I believe that you do as well. And Scripture says many times that there's something about the power of words. And I am no prophet, but I believe in speaking things into reality. Is that all right? I believe into speaking things into reality. Existence. What does the Bible say? I heard someone just say this in service. It was amazing. They said that God we serve is a God of the not. And he chooses those which are not. In other words, when you say I'm not qualified, I'm not resourced, I'm not equipped, I'm not empowered, you're his choice because he chooses those which are not. But he sees that which is not as though it were, right? And when he puts his hands on the knot, he begins to speak what he knows can be reality for you and I. Amen. And so I want to speak some things to you tonight to encourage you and to challenge you. And in the process, I would like for us to unite our voices and speak some of these things prophetically over this house of worship. Is that okay? And see things not as they are, not as they are not, but though as they will be in the eyes of the Lord. Is that okay? Are you with me tonight? All right, we're going to do that together. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray together that he will just move over us the next few moments, that his spirit and power will move in, that he will customize a word for each one of you because our God is so good at customizing the words of the man of God for our ears that we might hear something encouraging. And I'm praying that you're going to feel empowered and challenged over the next few minutes. But I'd like for you to pray with me. I love what the psalmist said. He said, open my eyes that I might see the wonders in your law or your word, your instruction. And I'm going to tell you right now, I am human as they come. And there is so much of me that gets in the way sometimes of seeing the wonders in his word and how it plays out in my life. And there are many times where I'm saying, God, open my eyes, help me to overcome my shortcomings, that I could actually peer into the wonders of your word and the work it would like to do in my life. And it's, I think the psalmist was just admitting, I'm very human, and if I don't get some help from heaven, I'm not going to see what you want me to see, Lord, so open my eyes. So that's the heart of our prayer. Will you pray that with me? God, I thank you for Eastgate. I thank you for your hand that's upon this house of worship. 
worship and ministry and the worshipers that gather here. I thank you for this community of Camas and Washugal and the work that you're doing and are still to do as you receive glory in this community. God, we pray together that you would do something supernatural and you would begin to open our eyes to see the wonder in what is to be said here tonight, that we would be encouraged, that we would see your purpose for the present and the future, God, that you would help us to speak boldly and with conviction prophetically over what is to come in this community and in this house of worship. We just magnify you and worship you together, and we give you great praise, for there is not another like you, Lord Jesus. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise together. assuming it was Jesus. All right, let's get into this tonight and be encouraged together. We're going to start off in Nehemiah 4 and 14. I love this passage, Nehemiah 4 and 14. It says, and I looked, I know I'm moving fast. I feel the pressure of all the text on these pages. Nehemiah 4 and 14. It says, and I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. I love this passage. Uh, just recently, our church went through something called the Fight Club. I think in about 2011, there was a church in Indiana that created this uh, spiritual growth uh, focus and ministry called Fight Club. And this Nehemiah 4 and 14 is the heart of the 10 weeks. And it was all about spiritually fighting together that we might be victorious. And in this passage, you have a leader, and he is with the Lord's army, if you will, and they are far out outnumbered. They are looking at the odds and it is very, very overwhelming. And yet he looks at the people and he says, hey, don't be afraid of what you see. Remember our Lord who is great and awesome and then fight. He says, you got to fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And I'm coming to tell you, it's an hour in which the Lord is saying, don't be afraid of what you see around you. Don't be afraid of the odds that are in front of you. But remember how great and awesome our God is and start to fight and contend for your households, for your house of worship, for your community, because God can do something when we start to fight. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to fight. In Psalm 92 and 12, it says this. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. They shall be they shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. I love this passage because it says you and I are meant to flourish, not wither, but we're meant to flourish. In Psalms 92 and 13, the next verse, it says those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Now, you're the choir tonight. I'm preaching to the choir, but there is a great yet simple revelation in this passage. It says those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. You got to plant your feet in the house of the Lord if you want to flourish. You can't occasionally show up to the house of the Lord and expect to flourish, but you got to plant your feet in the word of the Lord and regularly visit and dwell in the word of the Lord. Amen. John tells us, John chapter 8 is around verse 31 and 32. It says Jesus spoke to the Jews who believe and he said unto them if you want to be my disciples you must continue in my word and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free there are a lot of people that are disappointed right now because they've been told if they will just believe in Jesus Christ all their problems will fall aside I'm going to tell you it's powerful when you believe in him but that's just the beginning Jesus was talking to believers and he said if you want to be free you're going to have to know my word for my word is what will set you free not just believing but knowing and experiencing and having a relationship with my word will set you free in other words you got to plant your feet in the house of the lord and make it your dwelling place not just a house you visit thank you preacher down there in the front 
But look, it says you got to plant your feet. you got to get planted in the house of the Lord, and then you can flourish. So here's what I've come to challenge you to do tonight. You're going to have to fight to flourish. I tell people all the time, God didn't invite you on a cruise ship. He invited you to be on a battleship. And there is a position for everybody that says, yes, Lord, I will join your army. But it is a fight. It's a battle. We are contending for the faith. And it's one we can be victorious in. I would tell you the only way to lose is by not fighting. All you got to do is fight. It's just get your sword, get your heart, and say, I'll fight. I won't be afraid of the odds. I won't be afraid of the circumstances, but I will fight. And it's amazing what God will do when we say, yes, I will fight. It's important to remember, folks, that God desires for us to flourish. He did not redeem you and I. He did not give us life everlasting and a life of abundance that we might wither. It's not his will that finances wither, that our families wither, that our health were to wither, that our houses of worship would wither. His desire is that we will flourish, amen. And in order to flourish, you got to contend a little bit. you got to fight a little bit like they said in Nehemiah. Am I in four and 14? Now, here's a few things, and I can't qualify all of this because of time. So I'm going to give you something to chew on, all right? Here's a few things to consider. You are not going to flourish if you're faking it. You got to fight to flourish. You can't fake to flourish. It doesn't work. We got a culture that loves to fake it, but faking it doesn't work. I don't spend a lot of time on social media because there's a lot of fake on social media. There's a lot of highlights of life and not much about reality or the low points of life on there, right? But we have to remember this. It, my flesh likes to fake it. My flesh would love to fake it, but I've got to remember it. Counterfeit is not going to help me flourish. Being a charlatan is not going to help me flourish. Being a pretender is not going to help me flourish. I've got to find some fight in me, some sincerity, some meaningfulness in me, and then I can begin to flourish as God has called me to flourish. Let me tell you another one. We can't fear to flourish. That's a big one right now. There's a lot of fear in our culture right now and in our nation right now and around the world. But fear is not a new thing. Fear has been around a long time. That's why the Lord said, I didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. But I'm going to have to find some fight in me in these last hours that we are living in. I cannot let fear consume me and cause me to cower or panic. That's a big one right now. People are panicking because of the pressure of fear. Long time following. Followers of Jesus Christ are panicking lately because of the pressures of fear. But we've got to recognize it's not a time to fear. It's not a time to chance it. It's not a time for worry or dread like Pastor said. It's a time for fighting. It's a time to worship more, gather more, give more, seek the Lord more. It's not about fear or faking. It's about fighting. Now I'm going to give you another one. You can't flirt to flourish. All right. You can't flirt with God and flourish. You can't tease him on Sunday and diss him on Monday and flourish. Right. I can't either. I'm preaching to myself right now. I can't either. Not only can I not flirt with God and flourish, I cannot flirt with Satan and flourish. And I cannot flirt with my flesh or the world and flourish. Because it's so dangerous. I I want you to be honest with yourself right now. And I want you to think, have you ever led God on? Have you ever chatted up God? I have. When I ask that question, it always gets quiet. And it gets quiet in me, too, folks. Think about that. It's so easy at times to try to woo God to get what we want or feel justified about some things. And if I'm not careful, I'll chat God up. But it's not a fight. It's not sincere. And it does not help me flourish. But to flourish, as Nehemiah said, and there's so many examples, the Apostle Paul writes, I fight. He says, I'm a fighter, right? We fight to flourish. We engage in war. We battle. Think about this one for a second. We quarrel with ourselves to flourish. 
I'm going to tell you what, I fight with myself more than anything else. It's true. I have moments where God helps me to see myself and I don't like what I see. And I have to contend with my own self to try to be victorious and flourish. Sometimes myself's the biggest problem I have. I'm glad you don't have that problem and you're amazing. But it's the biggest challenge I have. Literally, there are days where I'm encouraging myself like David said. I'm having a conversation with myself and putting myself in check. I'm literally quarreling and fighting with myself so that I can flourish in Jesus Christ and become who he wants me to be. And so I quarrel with myself. I endeavor. I fight. I vigorously work to win. I clash sometimes. I pursue. I uphold. I'm a champion of faith. I resist sometimes. But you know what I got to do before? I resist I got to submit to God you guys ever heard this before resist the devil and he will flee how many times have you heard it that way a lot right you know how the scripture says it submit to God resist the devil and he will flee no I like that other version resist the devil and he's gonna walk away I don't want to talk about submitting to God I just want to talk about, you know, resisting the devil. But it says if you'll yield to me, then you can resist him and flee. Why? Because when you submit to me, I become your backing. And when the devil looks at you and you resist, he doesn't see you. He sees my silhouette raised above you as your backing. And then he cannot contend with you any longer. But that don't happen if I'm not submitted. I remember in the Bible, I'm on tangents already. I remember some sons of Sceva. They said, hey, I think we'll go. They were super zealous. I think we'll go deal with this man who's possessed with spirits. And they said, oh, we come to you in the name that Paul preaches. And they talk about a bunch of stuff. And that devil says, he says, oh, Paul, I know about Jesus. I know about, but I don't know you. In other words, you must not be too submitted to your God because I don't see any sort of standing behind you. I don't see any backing behind you, and I don't know who you are. And the Bible says they ripped that guy's clothes off of him, beat him, and he ran away away crying come on the problem was he came in Paul's God it wasn't his God it's got to be ours when we submit then we can resist we can fight we can flourish sometimes fighting is literally taking up spiritual arms it's practicing it's falling out with sin and falling in with Jesus sometimes fighting is putting a muffle on my mouth or putting a muffle on my Facebook page. Or putting a muffle on my Instagram account. Sometimes fighting is me again contending with myself and putting a muffle on my mouth. And swallowing my pride. Because there's nothing more I want than to flourish in Christ Jesus in the hours that we live in. Because it's going to be a flourishing church that's going to change the world in the hours that we live in. I'm telling you that people who are hungry are not looking for a fake church. They are not looking for a flirting church. They are looking for a real church that is a fighting church that is a worshiping church where there is an anointing there and present amen a couple of things that I want I'm giving you some stuff to study I want you to realize it's important to consider the following when you fight the first thing is if you're gonna fight somebody which by the way I'm not much of a fighter I'm a lover but anyways I do my research if you want to fight you got to be quick don't fight without the Holy Ghost because the Bible says it quickens you and I. It makes you quick. There's nothing to make you spiritually quicker than the Holy Spirit and walking in the Spirit. You'll quickly know that was a lie when before you would have no clue at all. You quickly know that was the devil showing up on its ugly face. And in the past, you would not have known that. It's amazing what the Spirit of the Lord does when it comes to this fight that I'm in. It quickens me. It moves me. The Word of God quickens me as well. you got to have punching power hour when you fight. It's probably why I'm not a fighter. But I want you to know this. When it comes to a punch, there's more to it than just strength. There's timing, there's coordination of the body, and there's sensing, sensing and opening. I wish I could preach all night, but I can't. The first thing is timing. You don't want to do anything without God's timing. 
The strongest punch that you can send or blow or the swing you can make is when it's God's timing when you make the swing. And that's the thing is I'm in a fight. It's a spiritual fight. It's not against flesh and blood. But when I fight this fight, I need the Holy Spirit so I'm quick. I need God's timing so my punch has some power in it. I need the coordination of the body. If you think you don't need the house of God and the children of God and the brothers and sisters there to make it, you're far off the path. The Bible says that it's the body working together in tandem and cooperation that changes the world. You want to know what's going to make your punch strong and mighty? It's being coordinated with your brothers and sisters and your pastor. It'll change your punch when you're fighting in this battle that the Lord has given you. How about sensing and opening? I love it when I hear pastors say, oh, I feel something changing. I like it when I hear children of God who are spirit-filled saying, I sense an opening. That means something super powerful is about to happen when you key into an opening and you move according to God's will. The next thing you need when you fight is you need defense. That's about movement. I would. I go to a kickboxing gym from time to time. They teach me about movement. It's about positioning of arms and body again. And it's also very much about observation. Right? When you are fighting this spiritual fight, sometimes you just got to quiet yourself and watch a little bit. It's about observation at times. The next thing is conditioning. When you're trying to fight a good fight, you got to be conditioned. That's about maximum effort during practice. Think about that with me for a minute. Maximum effort during practice creates maximum output when the fight is on. But you know how we are as humans? We don't like to fight until it's fight time. We don't like practice. Do we? We don't like practice. When everything's going good and there's no war on my radar, I give it 50% at Tuesday night prayer meeting. But 50% is not going to produce 100% victory. Right? And my victory has as much to do with what I'm doing at practice as it does what I'm doing on the field on Friday night on the football field, right? It's about the practice as much as it is when the game clock starts or the fight clock starts. And sometimes we got to recognize as children of God, I've got to be diligent about practicing. I've got to give 100% even when life is perfect and there's nothing going wrong in my life. I've got to recognize the importance of what I am doing even during practice moments. How about this one? Discipline. I want you to think about this statement. Conduct off the battlefield leads to victory or loss on the battlefield. It goes back to the practice, right? My conduct, my discipline, what I'm building into my life when I am off the field is as important as what's going on in my life when I am on the battlefield. And that's why every single day is God's day in my life. I got to be plugged in every single day, not just on practice day. I got to think about is my practice, is what I'm doing right now going to help me when God puts my feet back on the fight field? Because right now is as important as the fight moment. Amen. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise with me? The next thing you got to have when you're fighting and trying to fight a good fight is you got to have guts. You got to have a heart. You got to have a heart to fight. You got to have a heart for this to be hit. Because even the best fighters get hit. It takes guts to get hit. That's why I'm a lover and not a fighter. I don't like getting hit. It takes guts to get hit, right? But think about that. In this fight that we're on, what does Scripture say? When I fall, I shall arise. He says, I got so much gut that I know I'm going to take a hit or two on the battlefield, and I'm going to fall. But I'm going to get up after I get punched in the gut, and I'm going to keep fighting this fight because I've got heart to be in the battle even when I know I'm going to fall at times. And I'm going to tell you this last part and keep going. It takes intelligence. It takes intelligence. Hey, man, it takes intelligence to fight this fight. God is a God of battle plans. Sometimes I get so pumped up and so zealous, I run into hell with no plan. And then I'm like, God, you need to save me. And God's like, I didn't put you there. You got fired up and didn't even ask me. 
right? It's happened to me before. I love, I talk to our church about this all the time. I said, folks, let's be honest about where we are and let's build a battle plan together. Let's take a look at the struggles that you're in. Let's sit down over some coffee and have a prayer meeting together and build a battle plan that the Lord is helping us to carve out. And in our battle plans, there's always two columns. There's my column and there's God's column. And in my column, I put everything in there that I know I need to do to overcome the battle that I'm in right now. And then in God's column, I put what he's going to have to do because I can't do it. And I begin to pray it and believe you're going to do this, God, as I do this. He says, what, you draw nigh to me? I'll draw nigh to you. In other words, Chad, you take care of your column, and I'll take care of my column. And it's amazing how much the battle is better when you got a plan. Amen? I'm really practical, you guys. I'm just practical as they come. All right, so let's keep going. Everybody okay? You with me? All right, here we go. I'm having fun. I hope you are. If you're not, I will pay you back. We'll give you your registration money back. All right? Um, buy you a coffee later or something. Check this out, okay? Let's let's consider let's consider what flourishing looks like according to some scripture. We talk about fighting to flourish. Well, what does that look like? Psalm 92 and 12. I'm reading it again. It says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree and shall grow like a cedar. I'm I'm about to preach to you about palm trees and cedar trees. You ready for that? Palm trees. In Judaism, palms represent peace and plenty. God says, when you flourish, you got peace and plenty. Peace and plenty. He says, I'm going to make my children like palm trees. Peace and plenty. Peace and plenty. Think about that with me. I want peace and plenty. That's what I want. Also, we find that palm trees have an ancient history with humans as old as the first societies. Okay? And Romans, oh, I love this part. Romans gave palm branches as a symbol of triumph to those who were champions in games and in war. If you had a palm branch, it meant you were a triumphant warrior. Think about this. God says my righteous will flourish and be like palm trees. In other words, they will become a symbol of triumph in the earth. Come on. Don't underestimate who you are in Lord Jesus Christ and what he's doing in your life. Because I'm telling you, you are his symbol of triumph in this community and in the earth. Whenever the Lord is walking around heaven, he's looking at you and he's saying, oh, look at my palms down there. Look at that symbol of triumph that I have in Camas and Washougal and Vancouver in the Portland metro area. You literally become a symbol of triumph. You want to know why Satan hates you so much? Because you're God's symbol of triumph. And he can't stand it. He's jealous of that because of the symbol of triumphant that is upon you every single day because you are flourishing in Christ Jesus. I like it. I want to represent him, and I want to represent being triumphant in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that when we're flourishing, we're never in a battle. I'm actually saying most of this life we're battling, but we can be triumphant in every single battle when we're fighting with the Lord according to his word and his will. Check this one out. One type of palm tree can grow up to 197 feet tall. I had no idea until I started researching palm trees. 197 feet high. Who knew that palm trees were God's skyscrapers? Think about that with me. A palm tree can be almost 200 feet tall tall. What am I saying? Jesus intends for his kids to ascend to high places. He said when you flourish, you're going to be like a palm tree. You're going to ascend to high places in my kingdom when you are flourishing because of your fight in your walk with me. I love that because I want to ascend to every high place God has designed for my life. I want to see the 197 feet in Jesus Christ that he's written into my story. I want to fight 
because I don't want to be on ground level. I want to be up in a high point where I can see everything that the Lord is doing. Joshua 10 and 7 says this. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him and all the mighty men of valor. I love that because if you know anything about Gilgal, at Gilgal, right before they were going to start possessing the land God had promised them, God had a meeting with Joshua and he said, Joshua, we got a problem. The generations on the battlefield have not been circumcised. And he said, before you go any further, they all, young, old, all have to be circumcised. Before they step into the greatest fight, our starting fight, which was Jericho. This is right before Jericho. He says, you're going to have to cut away some sin and some stuff in your life. And what's so amazing is Joshua said, okay, Lord. And he went and he told all the men, everybody this applied to. And they agreed, believe it or not. They agreed to what God had called for. And the Bible says after that tough, bloody, if you will, moment, like repentance can be sometimes. If you really repent, it hurts a whole lot sometimes when we repent. But it says after the repentance moment happened that Joshua ascended, began to ascend in God's will to high places as they made their way into war and that's what I want us to recognize it's God's will for you to ascend I don't care what the devil's telling you I don't care what your past is telling you I don't care what your family or your neighbor is telling you it is God's will that you ascend that you flourish like a palm tree and be 197 feet tall in the kingdom of heaven and in the spirit of the Lord amen I receive that tonight hallelujah Listen to this one, Psalm 24 and 2. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Look at this, verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. That was Joshua and his men. In that moment, they had pure hands and a clean heart. And the Lord said, go ahead and ascend into the promises that I have set in the earth for you. And that's exactly what began to happen. I want you to know that I'm fighting this good fight. I'm striving to submit myself to the Lord every single day with hopes that I'll have clean hands and a pure heart that I might begin to ascend to high places in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. I believe this is going to be a house of palm trees that's going to ascend to heights that no one had ever thought would happen. I think we ought to speak that over our life and Eastgate right now. God's got some places for Eastgate to ascend to that we can't even imagine or we haven't even thought of yet. Why? Because God said my church will be like a palm tree. It's going to be a skyscraper in the earth, and that includes Eastgate as well. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I was just talking to the, our church about this, and this goes back to the ascension thing and even some of the passage before that. That's some of the things I said a few minutes ago. Uh, I was recently listening to something while I was driving, and it was, I don't even know how I, I, don't even know how I was listening to it, but it was about, um, it was about baseball. I, I'm not a big baseball guy, but it was about baseball. I was driving somewhere, and they were talking about home plate. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I was not praying in the spirit. I wasn't fasting. I was driving my car in traffic while baseball was on. And God said, home plate is like church. And I was like, all right, I can work with that. So I started studying home plate. All right. And it's, an, it's another message in itself. But what I learned so much that's amazing about home plate. For instance, home plate is the only base that has five sides. The only base in your week with five sides is the church and it's called the fivefold ministry hey first second third's really important but if you don't put your foot on home plate you don't get any points all right but here's another thing i learned i love this home plate is the only base on ground level some of you softball and baseball people know that all right 
Think about this. You can't get to the second floor without the ground floor. You can't be a palm that's 197 feet in the sky if you're not putting your feet in the house of worship. That's cool. And I'm going to keep going. All right. I love this one. I want to speak this prophetically over this house of worship. There are over 2,500 species of palm trees. I hope you know where I'm going. Come on. The Bible says, he says, my people will be like palm trees. They will flourish. In other words, my church is going to have many languages in it. The righteous is white, black, brown, red. God's house is meant to be full of people of the earth. Every language and every tongue should be found in the house of God. He said, oh, this church I'm going to raise up someday is going to flourish and it's going to be like palm trees. There's 2,500 different types of palm trees. I'm coming to tell you there's hundreds of different types of worshipers and every one of them are meant to be at 197 feet and every one of them are meant to be in the house of worship. And I thank God for that today and I pray every single day I say oh God let your church be 2,500 strong of different language groups and people groups to represent your kingdom and represent the earth one of my favorite churches that I've been able to preach at is in Montreal Quebec they have 83 nationalities On Sunday night, all the different churches come together for one service and have communion. And in that service, there's 83 different languages and nationalities. And I think in that service, oh, yeah, you said we would flourish like the palm tree. In other words, there's a whole lot of us coming from different backgrounds and different language groups. But we're all meant to be in a powerful, flourishing church. And it's a great indicator that we are flourishing. Hallelujah. Mm. Come on. Why do we fight this good fight? Because every human being should hear about the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. Check this one out. The largest seed of any plant in the world is made by a palm tree. It's called the Coco de Myrrh, I guess. Help me, Jesus. Check this out. The seed weighs 60 pounds. And it is at least 20 inches in diameter. You can Google it and see it. It's massive. Hey, you know where I'm going, right? The seeds we sow when we flourish in the Lord have no rivals. He says, my kids will flourish. And the seeds they sow in the break room have no rivals. The seeds they sow at the farmer's market have no rivals. There is no seed like the seed of my children, and it far surpasses any other seed that would be planted in someone else's life. Don't underestimate what God is trying to do through your life, because when you flourish in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is not a seed that can rival the seeds that are planted in people's lives because of the work that Jesus Christ does through you. Why is this church so important in the earth? Because there is no seed to be found like the seed of the church of the living God. It cannot be rivaled. I don't care what the devil has for the communities, for our families. It cannot rival the seeds of the church of the living God and the work that he's trying to do. Why do I fight this good fight every single day even when I feel like I'm losing? Because I know the seeds that are coming forth from my life through the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be rivaled. So we cannot underestimate our value and our impact when we are flourishing as God has intended for us to flourish. Hallelujah. You can't do that. You can't underestimate what God is doing through you. When you walk into a coffee shop to get your regularly Monday morning coffee, the whole room changes when you step in there. I know you're tired and don't realize it, but there are other people in that room that feel something that they did not feel before you walked in that room. And sometimes we lose sight of that because we're weary and we're tired or we're distracted, but we've got to remember who we are. We are the sons of God, the daughters of God, and he's 
said you're going to flourish like a palm. The seeds that I bring forth from your life, there is not another seed like this seed that I have with my Jesus, okay, we got to hurry. The next one is this. A palm has been traditionally noted as a symbol of life. The Assyrians believed that the ultimate symbol of eternal life was a tree growing beside a stream, often a palm tree. They saw that as the ultimate symbol of eternal life. The tree they valued the most was a palm tree because to them it represented life. What does Jesus say, John 10 and 10? I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. There is a reason why people gravitate to you. There's a reason why they want to be near you at work and in the in the market marketplace at times because there's something about what God is doing in your life. You're becoming a symbol of abundant life and people want to be near the symbol. They want to know why you have peace that they don't have. Why you can handle that situation better than they can handle that situation. And you and I, through Christ Jesus, become a symbol of true life in the earth that he's planted us in. Check this out. Palms, when cared for correctly, are cleansed. They're cleansed. He says, you're going to flourish like a palm. You're going to be clean. I'm going to wash you with the waters of baptism. I'm going to baptize you with my spirit. I'm going to wash you with my word every single day. And you're going to be like a palm. You're going to be clean and pure. Now, I love this one. Palms are at home in dry, desolate places. You keep asking God why he keeps putting you there. And sometimes he's putting you there because he needs life there. And you are his symbol of life. In nature, it is found in desert oases as it will tolerate low rainfall and a fairly high degree of soil salinity. One of the largest desert oases is in Jericho, which is watered by a very large stream called the Spring of Elisha. And Jericho is known as the city of palm trees. And even today, they form the most conspicuous vegetation in the area because while it is a desert place, they can still thrive in desolation. You want to know why the church of the living God was thriving in 2020 when it was desolate and struggling? Because he says, when my church fights, it becomes like a palm tree. I can put it in a desolate place and it'll still grow. It'll still represent life. It'll still produce something spectacular. Why is it that you and I can go through some of the worst of times and there's still something powerful produced in our life? Because he says, I'm going to make you like a palm and it thrives in the wastelands and in the desolate places. That's you and I. The Lord said, I preached this at the Washington Conference. He said, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to put something inside of you that's going to spring up from within. He said, I'm going to put roads in deserts and I'm going to put a path in wastelands. What was he saying? He said, I'm about to change the heaven and earth. I'm going to give my life and I'm going to put my spirit inside of humanity and it's going to begin to spring forth from within them and if they're in a desert and a dry place, it won't matter because they're like a palm. They represent life and can endure even the desolations of life. You're important to him. It's an exciting time. I know it was a hard time in 2020. I was a church planner and it was very ugly at times. And yet I can still rejoice because there was life in the middle of that desolate time. There was life in the middle of that struggle because when you are a palm and you are flourishing, you can live in desert places. And go through desolate experiences. Oh, the palm was prominent in the decoration of the temple. In 1 Kings 6 and also 2 Chronicles 3, we find that the walls of the temple were actually adorned with palm trees. You are his decoration. You're his ornament. His chamber is adorned with images of you. You're God's exhibit. 
I went and visited a friend recently, and he took me through his house, and he showed me all the picture walls. And he didn't show me any cars, and he didn't show me any big houses. He showed me kids and grandkids and moms and dads and uncles and sisters and brothers. And he walked me through and he showed me all of that. And as he was doing that, I began to think of what the Lord said. My kids will be like palms. In other words, I'm going to decorate my throne room with their image. And I thought, oh, I wonder how often God is in heaven. And he says, come on over here and take a walk with me, angel. I want to show you some stuff. And then he's walking through the glory of heaven. He says, oh, look at Pastor Torres in Camas, Washington fighting the good fight. I got him right here on the wall. Look at my kids in Camas and Washougal. They keep fighting and fighting. And he begins to decorate his most private places with the image of his children. The Bible says there is a city in the heavens that is glad. A river can make that city glad. And it goes on to say the river is her. He makes the river human. In other words, I believe when you and I are flourishing, you put a smile on heaven's face and he hangs your picture on his family wall and he begins to decorate his kingdom with his children not possessions and not victories but his own children you matter so much to him that in his dwelling places he's pointing at you not silver and gold and saying look at how wonderful and beautiful they are they're going to be like palms I'm going to pull them all over my house and celebrate them. Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, you're going to feel. You are going to feel Eastgate with palms. You have, you have so many pictures of your sons and daughters yet to be hung on the throne room walls. But I speak it in the name of Jesus. The house will be full of palms. You're going to decorate the heavens with the beautiful sons and daughters that you will give life to under the cover and the wings of Eastgate. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right, I'll hurry and I'll finalize this with you. He said palms and cedars. Palms and cedars. Check this out. Solomon used cedar to build Jerusalem. Now, I said a second ago, he used palms to decorate the temple. Solomon used cedars to build Jerusalem. God said, when you fight and you flourish, you become like a cedar. In other words, I will build my kingdom with you. He used the cedars to build Jerusalem. God says, I'm using my sons and daughters, lively stones, right, to raise up a powerful kingdom. You are in a kingdom that's far greater than any kingdom in this earth. And the king of that kingdom, nothing in this earth can compare. You are his son and you are his daughter and he is building that kingdom with you. You matter to him because he uses you to build his kingdom in the earth and into the hearts of humanity in this earth hallelujah the bible describes cedar like this it says it's strong and durable isaiah 9 and 10 graceful and beautiful psalm 80 and 10 high and tall fragrant it smells good come on you smell good to the lord when you fight and you flourish he likes the scent that comes from your life and from your sacrifice and from your service and from your suffering because you're a scent to him you're a fragrance to him It says they spread wide. Ezekiel 31 and 3 says this, Behold, I will liken you to a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and a forest shade. Another passage in Psalm 104 and 16 says, The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. A few more things about cedars. The cedars of God is the most famous cedar patch. It's called the Cedars of Lebanon. It's the most famous cedar patch and one of the last vestiges of old growth forests in the world. 
It is an attraction in the world. It's called the cedars of Lebanon to this day. I want you to catch this with me. My God says when you fight and you flourish, you become one of my last vestiges in the earth. You become so spectacular. There's nothing else like you in the earth and become one of the last of my creation and my handiwork. I love that the Lord said a remnant is all that he needs to change the world. He just needs a remnant. That last vestige in Lebanon right now is not as great of a patch of trees as it once was. Yet it is still as glorious as it's ever been. Sometimes we get too caught up in the numbers game. God does not play the numbers game like we play the numbers game. He says, no, no, no. You might be small in number and they may call you a remnant. But I've changed the world on numerous times with just a remnant of my sons and daughters. Because there's nothing like the last vestige in the earth and it's my kids who flourish like cedars cedar trees symbolize resilience strength elevation the cedars in Lebanon are a refuge for other life I love that if you read about those cedars it becomes a refuge for so much other life it talks about how it's a refuge for birds and insects and mushrooms and flowers and people. It's amazing. You will be a refuge to other lives around you when you flourish in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the wonder of it. Sometimes that's the reason why people are attracted to you once again. Because your space becomes like a refuge for them. It's like they step under God's canopy and they don't feel all that fear anymore. They're not as focused on all of the struggle and the trouble and dysfunction in their life because they step into a place with you and you are a refuge for other life when you flourish. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. I love that one of the highlights of cedars is that they're resilient. When I fall... I shall rise. I am resilient. I bounce back quickly, right? That's his church. That's you and I. Resilient, quick. The last one. Oh, I love this one. This is my last one, you guys. And I'm not coming back. So you're, you're going to be s- delivered in a few minutes for, uh, from Chad. Cedars historically have been used to float imperial navies and transport goods. Throughout the history of man, cedar was the choice to float, to carry some of the most powerful and significant things. He says, when you flourish, you're going to become my carrier. You will carry me into the coffee shop. You will carry me into the family reunion. You will carry me into a factory. You will carry me into a school. You will carry me into a market. When you and I are flourishing, we become his carriers. And you have the distinct honor and opportunity to carry him places he otherwise could not go. So what does that mean? That means your favorite restaurant is not your favorite restaurant. Your favorite workplace is not your favorite workplace. Your favorite grocery store is not your favorite grocery store. What am I saying? The grocery store, the marketplace, the coffee shop, your job is your mission field. It's your mission. And when your feet step in that space, you have brought the king of kings into that space. Wow. Come on. What an honor. What an honor to be a carrier of Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus, thank you for the opportunity. Jesus, you are a carrier 
of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When we fight and we flourish, we become like the cedar, his chosen to carry him into the world. Ephesians says he will do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That's the key part. He says, oh, man, when my kids flourish, they become like cedar and they take me places and I begin to do things they cannot even imagine. Or think in their minds. There are times when I go into places in the Portland metro area. And the atmosphere changes. It's not because of me. It's all because of him. Guys, there's sometimes I'm so not being spiritual that I don't even notice the atmosphere changed. Because I'm tired. But I go in and in some places the atmosphere changes. And some people in the room gravitate to it because they're so hungry for something different. And other people in the room don't like what they feel. And they start to give me looks. And they're not as nice to me when they serve me food as they're nice to the other people on the other table. And sometimes when I'm not careful, I'm like, what, what did I do wrong? I didn't do anything. You and I are carriers. Wherever we go, we have the opportunity to carry the Lord. And there is spirits in those places that don't like what we brought in the room. Right? But what a joy it is to be his carriers. Would you stand with me? You survived. God bless them. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. 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 Thank you, God. We love you, Jesus. We worship you, God. We praise you. I don't know if I said it at the summer conference, but I, I've, I've heard someone say this, and I think it's something worth considering. This is the statement. The statement is this, that the North American church is wonderful at making members and terrible at making missionaries. I think they're going to post this somewhere, so I hope I don't get in trouble. But I hear people say this sometimes, and I'm not the biggest fan. They say, some people go and some people give. It sounds really good on the surface. But I think if the world's going to be changed, everybody will go and everybody will give. Because if I'm not careful, I will justify not going by giving. And I'll say, well, I gave so that guy could go to Africa. And I'm not going into my local community and being a palm and a cedar. What made that New Testament church so powerful? They all gave and they all went. They did it in decent and in order. They had pastors, spiritual leadership. I'm not saying get out from under any of that. I'm just saying if we want the world to be changed, we're all going to fight. We're all going to fight with everything we have. We'll all give. We'll all go into the community we're planted in. And we'll be those flourishing cedars and palms. And that will begin to change people's lives when that happens. And I believe that there is an amazing thing happening among God's followers. We're starting to find some boldness and starting to execute some of that. And as that happens, I'm telling you, the world will not be the same. Sometimes I just need the Lord to help me remember who I am in him, not in myself, but who I am in him. So I will walk the way he wants me to walk today and recognize I'm a palm, I'm a cedar, and the earth can change today because of what Jesus Christ is doing in my life. Amen. And that is the same for you. Now, forgive me because I said a whole lot. But what did I say tonight that resonated with you? That's the most important thing. That's what you need to focus your heart on right now. As we begin to pray and responding to what we've heard tonight in this place, I would encourage you, focus your prayer on what hit you deep the most. Because that's what God was speaking to you about. Right? 
God is calling his church to fight. And he's saying if we'll fight like we've never fought before, he is going to do some supernatural, mind-blowing things. Things we cannot fathom. Things we cannot take glory for. And he is going to elevate us to high places so that the earth can be changed. But here's the question. Are we going to fight? Are we going to fight? Are we going to fight? Because it's a key element. I got to fight. I got to stop looking at all the things that I'm not. Because it don't matter what I am. It only matters what he is and what he wants to do. I heard somebody tell me this the other day. They said, you know what is messing us up? What's messing us up is trying to have a bunch of self-confidence and self-love and self-care. And this person had counted. This person had counted all the, the words in the story of David versus Goliath. He counted every one of them. He said there's not one word or phrase where David ever said, I just need to have confidence in myself. And he listed off all the words that David mentioned about him. He also never made made any real statements about his confidence in David either. Sometimes we have more confidence in our enemies than they have in themselves. And the Lord says, stop disqualifying yourself. Stop looking at yourself. It's not you anyways. It is all me through you. And fight. And so they're going to probably sing something in a second. And I, I'm calling you to have a talk with Jesus. I mean, a real, meaningful talk with Jesus. Not just an emotion driven talk with. I'm talking a real life talk with Jesus about your engagement in the fight and where you are and what resonated with you tonight. And maybe it was, wow, I didn't think God would ever let me go to high places. And he just said, no, I'm going to take you to high places. Get a hold of that and walk in that word tonight. And when the devil comes and speaks in your ear and lies to you and say that was not for you, you tell that devil he is a liar and a father of lies. And God has some incredible spiritual spaces to take me to. Jesus, I pray you would help us here tonight, God. Lord, only only you know what your intent was in this moment, Jesus. But God, we hear you tonight. We hear you reminding us of the importance of fighting, that it is your design, your will that we would flourish, not wither. And when we begin to engage God, it is amazing what you begin to do. And as we begin to flourish and become like cedars and palms, you begin to take us to new heights and new places. You begin, God, to make us a refuge for other life around us. God, we desire to be hanging on your throne room walls. God, we submit to you tonight. You can use me to build your kingdom. I'll be a lively stone in the wall of your kingdom if you will allow me to, Lord Jesus. I will no longer look in fear and be afraid of what is around me but I will hear your call to no longer be afraid but remember that you are great and you are awesome and I will find a weapon and I will become a fighter and I will fight Lord Jesus and in the fighting you're going to bring a flourishing into my life and I will be your cedar I will be your palm I will be your river and through us you're going to change this earth you're going to change this community Community. I declare it in your name according to your word that you will use this house. It will be full of palms. It will be full of fighters. It will be full of people who are not fake, who are not flirting, who are not playing games, but are fighters, who are serious, who are meaningful in their pursuit of you, and who will become tremendous giants and palms and cedars. Lord, I remind
remind your worshipers tonight that they are precious. They are more precious than silver and gold. They may be a remnant, but they are a part of the last vestige of cedars in the earth of your creation. And they are so precious unto you. And they are powerful because of what you're doing in their life. And I pray they will hear you tonight and they will see it. And it will grip their bones and get in their hearts. And it will change the way they lift their feet and the way that they move their hands and where their eyes go and where their ears listen and how their speech becomes differently in this earth, Lord Jesus. God, we worship you. We humbly bow before you tonight. We submit ourselves unto you tonight, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Lord, that we could be your palms. We thank you that we could flourish, oh God. And we give you praise. Hallelujah. I begin. I invite you to begin to really pursue the Lord. Let's have a good prayer meeting here for a few minutes. Just a conversation with Jesus. Oh, Lord, help us to see. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus, to what you have in store. The exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think that you have in store for this house of worship and for each of our homes, Lord.